we've, we've introduced signals, communication signals, we've done some analysis, represented them in the time and the frequency domain, uh, we've skipped some topic about analog and digital data, we may return to that later, we'll definitely at some stage, I don't know when, uh, but then we went on to last week transmission impairments and we, there are three main impairments. Attenuation, you transmit a signal with some strength and the, the characteristics of the medium that it passes via reduces the signal strength across distance. So the further the signal travels, the weaker it gets. That's called attenuation. It's noise. When there's other transmissions, so I'm transmitting, if there's no other noise, the receivers can receive. But as other sources generate signals, from the perspective of receiving my signal, those other sources create noise. And it makes it harder to receive the data. So noise is another impairment. The larger the noise, the harder to receive the data. And another one that we didn't, we didn't mention, but uh, also is related to those, is distortion. There were a few points on that, but we will not cover distortion. Let's look at uh, a signal and see the impact of noise on the signal. We finished last week with an example this one where we went through, we sent some data and the signal that represented that data, we added in some noise. So this is what's received. The receiver receives the, the transmitted signal or the attenuated transmitted signal plus the noise. So you think they're additive. And therefore the receiver has a signal and has to interpret what does this signal mean? So it maps the signal back to the data. Let's look at that again, but with a, a different example. And it's the one, did anyone bring it? The sheet from last week? Some of the sheet from last week. The, one, the gray ones on the back of that, we'll use some of them to, to give some examples. Actually, I didn't bring any spares, so hopefully people bring theirs. Just look at your own, I'll show you. I've got one. Some plots like this, it doesn't come out so well when we print it, but uh, hopefully after we go through it, it will make sense to you when you see it on your handout. We want to look at if we transmit a signal, and if there's some noise, well, what's the effect of that noise and the fact that it can cause errors? And it's similar to the previous example, but uh, it was some different impacts of noise. And I'm going to cover two cases. One with a very simple signal, this sine wave. Okay? And we're going to use this same concept, let's say a high component, transmit high if we want to send a bit one, transmit low if we want to send a bit zero. So this is a very uh, simple sequence of bits, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and so on. Okay? So this is the transmitted signal at the top. It's a sine wave, it's 1000 hertz, so the period is one millisecond. Those details are not so important yet. We transmit this signal and I've introduced some attenuation. So we transmit the signal at some strength, the signal travels across a link and it gets weaker. And in this example I'm going to say that the received signal if we ignore noise, the received signal is half the strength of the transmitted signal. So if I, we see in our plot of the transmitted signal, it goes from minus one up to plus one, that's the range, the received signal would be minus 0 0.5 up to plus 0 0.5. Just in this example I'm saying how much, how much signal strength do we lose across distance? I'm saying we lose half of it. In a later topic, we'll do some calculations to determine in practice how much uh, do we lose related to distance and other factors. But for this example, I say situation signal is half the strength of the transmitted one. 
But in addition to the attenuation, there's also noise. And the middle plot shows the noise. Noise we typically is, appears random. There's some fluctuations due to the environment that has no, no structure. Uh, in this case, what I've done is generated some small random variations to represent the noise in this case. With one exception at this time instant, or this uh, time of about, uh, it's about well, it's half a millisecond, for half a millisecond I increase the noise. Just through that half a millisecond and then back to just small random variations. I just created this just for this example. So from the perspective of the receiver, what the receiver receives is the transmitted signal, but attenuated, so shrunk in height, plus the noise. And you may have to make that out here that you see the received signal is following the sine wave, approximately. It doesn't go from minus one to plus one, it's going from about minus point of minus point five to plus point five. That's due to the attenuation. Plus, it's varying over time. That's due to adding in the noise. Okay. So we could say, and I'll, I'll try and draw what that uh, wrong picture. Uh, I'll find that picture so we can draw on it. Same one. What do we notice? Um, the system we can think is we've got a transmitted signal. TX is short for transmitter or transmit. It, I don't know how to draw it, we transmit the signal. It gets weaker in strength. So if we draw the transmitted signal over distance, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. That's the attenuation over distance. So it starts out strong, and as it travels across the link, it gets weaker. In our example, it gets half as weak as the, the transmitted signal. Plus, there's noise added in. So we think that there's also noise. And the received signal is the addition of the noise and the received or the attenuated transmitted signal. That's the model of the transmission system. I think we drew a picture of that last week as well. Now, what we want to do is work out whether the receiver receives the data correctly. And in this simple example, we're assuming this is a bit 1, bit 0, 1, 0. That's the transmitted data. So what the receiver does is they want to record the receive signal and see if it represents a bit 1 or a 0. How do they do that? How do they know if it's a 1 or a 0? You look at the received signal, how do you know if it represents bit zero, bit one or bit zero? What's a scheme that we could use? Anyone? Sorry? Amplitude, so if we look at the amplitude of the received signal, what about the amplitude? If the amplitude is positive, if it's above zero, that represents a bit one. If it's below zero, it represents a bit zero. There's one scheme, and that's what we'll use in this case, because the idea the transmitter will transmit a positive signal, it's above zero when we have a bit one, and below zero, negative, when we have a bit zero. Now, how much above? Well, we're going to say as long as it's positive, it's a bit one. If it's negative, it's uh, a bit zero. What we could do is, let's say, look at not just at one time instant, look at the average over a period of time. 
over how long? Well, how long is each bit in this case? This, if this was a 1 and a 0, we can think that the bit 1 starts, sorry, that's not there, it starts being transmitted here, finishes here, and the bit 0 starts here, uh, finishes here. That is, at time 0 0.001 second, we transmit a signal to represent the bit 1. We finish that at time what, 0 0.015 and then start transmitting the signal to represent the bit 0 and so on. So the duration for each bit is half a millisecond. If you follow those numbers, two bits in here we go from 1 millisecond to 2 milliseconds, 2 bits, so 1 bit in half a millisecond. So what the receiver can do at that same time instant, it's about here and here, let's say measure the signal strength during that time. Maybe take the average. And if the average is positive, assume we received a bit 1. And then during this next period, measure the signal strength. Is the, if the average is positive, assume we got a bit 1. If it's negative, assume we got a bit 0. And I think you see the pattern in this period. The, the signal is above 0, mostly. That is, the average value would be positive. So that would be a bit 1 received. Here, the values are all below the line. Negative. 0, above, okay, and you see it will follow, and I think we'll be successful if, I think you'll see the pattern, until we get to this highlighted part, and that's, that's the grayed out part there. So the received signal was not exactly the same as the transmitted one. It's attenuated, that's the first thing. It's much smaller in height, plus it has some random variations due to the noise. But on average, in this case, it's above zero. It's positive, so we still get a bit one. Everything's okay until we get to here. Our noise has increased due to some electrical disturbance, for example. Just for a short time, the noise jumped. See how that impacts upon our received signal. You, what you do, the receiver, is they look at the average of these values over time. It's hard to see. If you look close, you, I think you'll find that most, well, there's more time when the signal is above the line than below. Therefore, the average would be positive. If it's positive, what bit do we get? So bit 1 is received here. And I think you, at the same time, that should have been a bit zero. So that's our bit error occurring. Due to the noise, we've got a bit error. And we've seen this before. It's not so hard to follow this one. Let's try and put a few numbers to it, because of what I want to show the signal in particular, if we change the number of components in the transmitted signal, we can start to reduce the chance of bit errors. We've made the, the statement before, the more components in a signal, the more accurate that signal is, the less chance of errors. How many components in this transmitted signal? If we think of our sine equation, what is it? There's just a sine 2 pi f t. It's just a simple sign aside. It's not two added together. We don't have those two humps at the top. So this is a simple signal with just one component. And we got a bit error down here. Let's look at some of those values just during that period of the error. Um, what can we put? Focusing just on this part, what's the average value? 
and want to, want to have a guess? Oh. Just tell me if we take all these points along here, what would the average value be? 0.5? Is it going to be larger than minus 1? No, that it's going to be, if you look at, say, this line, you'd see, all right, the first point is 0, then minus 0 point something, goes along up to minus 1 and then back down to 0. If we add up all those numbers and find the average, it's going to be somewhere between 0 and minus 1. And in fact, you can find it, and I think it's about minus 0 0.63. you added up all those values, it's, it's definitely not minus 1 because some of the values are less than minus 1, uh, actually greater than, sorry, the negative is confusing. It's to do with the integral of a sine wave to find the area there, minus 0 0.63. So that's, let's say that's the average value during this, this time, the average value of the signal being transmitted. What about the noise? Oh, not during this period, what's the average value of the noise? Approximately. I don't know, maybe it varies about this line. Okay, it goes up above it, sometimes below it. So if we took the average of those values, it would be something around here. And if we map that back, it's a little bit less than 0 0.5. Let's say it's 0 0.45. I'm just approximating here. The numbers are not, the exact values are not so important. It's less than 0.5, it, it, but it varies a bit. Let's say the average is 0 0.45. So the average transmitted signal is minus 0 0.63. The average noise is 0 0.45. What's the average value of the attenuated signal? Ignoring noise. The attenuated signal that we would receive. It's not shown there. While you're thinking about it, I'll write down... Uh, here. So I think we transmit a signal, the average value is minus 0 0.63, the noise was 0 0.45, but we say when we transmit the signal it gets weaker across distance. How much weaker in our example? Half. So if we transmit it at minus 0 0.63, we'd receive a half of that. minus 0 0.315 uh, let's just keep it at two decimal points minus 0 0.31 half of minus 0 0.63 so we transmit a signal at this strength minus 0 0.63 it attenuates it would be received at minus 0 0.31 but there's also noise, so we add in the noise of 0 0.45. So the ultimate received signal is the attenuated signal plus the noise. Add those two numbers together, what do you get as an average value? Is it 0 0.14? Okay. This is, let's, this value is the average they're all average values. This is the transmitted signal, this is the attenuated signal
that is transmitted divided by 2. This is the noise, the average value of the noise, just for that period that we're focusing on. And this is the received signal, attenuated plus noise. Minus 0 0.31 plus 0 0.45. Positive or negative, the received signal? It's positive, which means we receive bit 1. Positive, plus VE is short for positive. That means bit 1 is received. And that was our bit error, remember? I'll go back up. We transmit at some level, it's attenuated, add in the noise, and the average receive value here, we found the average, is about 0 0.14. It's above 0, therefore we assume it was a bit 1. So I just tried to put some numbers to that concept of attenuated signal and then determines what is received. Any questions so far? That's the easy part. Now we'll move on to a different signal and see how the signal can improve the chance of avoiding errors. This was, just make note, our signal, our transmitted signal, had one component. That was just a sine wave. Let's try again with a different signal. And it's in the top left plot that you have in front of you. Here, everything is the same except of our transmitted signal. Instead of sending a sine wave, we send a square wave. How many components in our signal? To create a perfect square wave, how many components do we need if we add sine the soids together? Remember, you added two together, you get two humps at the top. When three, it was a, a few more humps, and we kept adding signs together. How many do we need to get a perfect square wave? An infinite number of components. So these two cases are the extremes. What if we have just one component versus what if we have an infinite number? It's actually not a perfect square wave, but it looks close to one. This has an infinite number of components. Everything else is the same. The noise is the same. The attenuation is the same. So focusing on our the, the time period where we had an error before, everything's looking fine until this period here with this spike of noise. What's the average value here? The average value transmitted. If you look at this is instantaneous, goes down to minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. It's always minus 1. Therefore, the average is minus 1. The noise is the same as the previous example. Nothing's changed there. So the average we said was 0 0.45. The transmitted signal is attenuated. It's reduced by half. So it drops down to minus 0 0.5. Yeah, 0 0.5. Let's write it. We transmit at a level, the average level of minus 1. It's attenuated. It reduces in strength as it travels across distance. Therefore, the attenuated one would be half. The noise is the same as the previous example, 0 0.45.
and the received signal is therefore the attenuator plus the noise, which is minus 0 0.05. Negative or positive? Okay, what bit? Implies bit 0 is received. we've got exactly the same noise, same attenuation, but two different signals, one with one component, one with an infinite number of components. With the infinite number of components, we don't get a bit error. With one component, we do get a bit error. This, is, this example is trying to show the fact that the more components you have in the signal, the more accurate it is, the less chance of bit errors. If you look here, if you look at the average value, you see it's just below zero, minus 0 0.05. These numbers are not so important, the exact values. Just trying to illustrate that okay, adding in the noise, does it bring us above zero or below zero? Why? Why using the square wave, we don't get a bit error, but we did with a sine wave? Well, the square wave is always minus one. So, whereas the sine wave only some, or only at one time point is at minus one. The rest, it's slightly, it's higher. So, there's more chance that the noise will cause the transmitted signal to change from, in our case, from negative to positive. We transmitted a negative signal. We add in the noise. If the received signal is negative we're okay. But if the received signal is positive, we get a bit error. In the sine wave, the received signal was positive, causing a bit error. But in this case, it's negative because adding in the noise doesn't impact on the entire transmitted signal as much as on the sine wave. How much noise, on average, do we need to cause a bit error for the square wave? If we transmit the square wave, what would the noise need to be to cause a bit error? Greater than 0.5. That is, the attenuated signal is minus 0 0.5. If the noise was greater than 0 0.5, when we add them together, we would swap the sign it would go from minus to positive, negative to positive, causing a bit error. So the noise would need to be a particular strength to cause a bit error in this case. If it's below that strength, we're okay. Whereas with the sine wave, how much noise was needed to cause a bit error on average? I'll, I'll show you the, the numbers just to remind you. Where are they? On average, how much noise is needed to cause a bit error with the sine wave? It needs to be greater than what? I think greater than half of this, minus, so 0.315. We had a greater than 0 0.315, 0 0.45 caused a bit error. If it was, I don't know, 0 0.1, it would not cause a bit error. Okay. So given the same conditions, two different signals give different quality of the received signal and different uh, chance of errors. So this is just an, a simplified example trying to show the point. More components in our transmitted signal, the more accurate the less chance of errors of that transmitted signal. Don't worry too much about calculating those numbers. That's not the point here. Just, they're just there to illustrate uh, 
to accompany the picture. Any questions before we move on to another part of signaling? Any questions towards the back? No? Okay, uh, in the question, I'll go back to the, the square wave. Uh, in the square wave, on average, what does the noise need to be? What's the average value of the noise that will cause a bit error? 0 0.5. That is, if we're at minus 1 and we add in 0 0.5, sorry, minus 1 attenuated brings us to minus 0 0.5, and then add in noise of 0.5, we're actually at 0. So if it was greater than that, it would bring us to positive. So the amount of noise needed to cause a bit error is the amount that when we add it to the received or the attenuated signal, it changes our sign from positive to negative, or if we're going in another example, from negative to positive. Because the way that the receiver worked was if my signal is positive, I assume I received a 1. If my signal is negative, I assume I received a 0. So if we transmit a 1, transmit positive, but the noise brings it down to negative, it'll be a bit error. So the, the question uh, I may, be, may have said the wrong thing before. It's not 0.05, it's 0 0.5. 0 0.5. The amount of noise is in fact half of the attenuated signal or possible range of attenuated signal. Related to that, if If the attenuated signal range from, let's say, minus 2 to plus 2, maybe a sine wave, a square wave that went from instead of minus 0.5 to plus 0.5, but the, the height was from minus 2 to plus 2, how much noise to cause an error? What's the magnitude of the noise that would cause an error in this case? If this, let's say the attenuated signal received was minus 2 and we add in a noise greater than 2, 2.1, it would go from minus 2 to plus 0.1 error. Or if the signal trans received was plus 2 and we added in a noise with a magnitude of minus 2.1, it would bring us from plus down to negative. So the noise needs to be greater than half of the range in this case. We may see that again when we look at, in a moment, uh, another signal. Let's go back to uh, uh, one of our earlier simple signals and look at how we can increase our data rate and we'll come back to an example of noise which you have on the printouts on the bottom two pictures. Here's a now let's, for now, assume no noise. Here's a transmitted signal, or let's say a received signal. You received this signal. It had two sign components added together using our normal pattern. 
What's the data received? What do you think it would could be? Try and think what the data received could be. If you receive this signal, what would you interpret the data to be? There are different ways, but I think following what we've done in, in the lectures up until now, we've said if the signal is plus one, represents a bit one. If it's low, negative one in this case, or close to, bit zero. So a way to interpret this when it's received is to think, okay, again, measure the signal for a period of time. Uh, over this period of time, measure the signal strength and look at the average. And if you look at the average over this time, it's, I think, about one. It goes above one here and here, but there's below and here. So average those values and you get one here. Plus one. And during this period, it's an average value of minus one. So we could interpret that this receive signal means data 1, 0, next bit. This is an easy one. And so on. This is just alternating 1s and zeros. So the simplest sequence, or a very simple sequence. What's the data rate? What's the data rate of this signal? Well, in our one second, look at the time frame down the bottom. In one second, four bits. Four bits per second. We calculated this in a previous lecture, this one. So we've seen this one before. Using the same scheme, uh, now before we move on, what's the duration of one bit? How long is one bit with respect to our signal? We have four bits in one second. Each bit is a 0 0.25 seconds. 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So each bit is represented by a signal for 0.25 seconds. We sometimes call this the, a signal element. And you may see the terminology come up in the lecture notes later, but this sending it on average plus one is sometimes called a, a signal element. And the duration, in this example, with duration a quarter of a second. We'll see the, that definition of signal element uh, later, but just since we're here. One signal element, another signal element, in one second, four signal elements. Okay, same scheme, different receive signal. What data did you receive? A signal element lasts for a quarter of a second. So in the first quarter of a second, what do we get? On average, it's one, bit one, one. Okay, not so hard. One, let's write it all. Same conditions as before. The signal element is a quarter of a second. The data rate is four bits per second. And all we're doing is when we have a bit to transmit, when I have a bit 1 to transmit, I send the signal so it's positive. If I have a bit 0, then I really swap it so it's negative. I change the amplitude to be negative. 
So we can generate any sequence, or we, we can generate a signal that represents any sequence of bits. How do we... Alright, now, the bandwidth that we have available is fixed. We cannot change it. The bandwidth in this one, we've calculated before. The frequency was what? We had a frequency of 2 hertz of our signal. Don't have to remember. It was 2 hertz, and I think we had a, a bandwidth of 4 hertz. It went from 2 hertz up to 6 hertz in this signal. So we had a bandwidth of 4 hertz. Let's say we cannot change that. We're fixed with the same bandwidth. We cannot change the signal equation, that is, the number of components. We still have two components. We can change some parameters, but the number of components we cannot change. We cannot change the or the number of components. How can we increase the data rate? How can we send faster? I want to send faster than 4 bits per second. The frequency of was... We've calculated before, it was... The frequency was 2 hertz. And remember the bandwidth with our signal equation with two components range from F, oh sorry, it was range from F to 3F. So the bandwidth was 3F minus F, or 2F, or in our case, 4 hertz. That was the original signal. If you increase the frequency to 4 hertz, you'll increase the data rate but the bandwidth increases as well. It would be 12 minus 4, 8 hertz. So yes, if you increase the frequency, in this case, you will increase the data rate, but your bandwidth also increases. And I'm saying you're not allowed to increase the bandwidth. Therefore, you cannot change the frequency. So how else can we increase the data rate? Cannot change the bandwidth or frequency, cannot change the number of components, we've only got two. I still want to send faster. Any ideas? Let's try. Here's a different signal, and I'm using a different scheme. What's different about this one? Look at the amplitudes. The shape is the same, these two humps, because it's two sine waves added together. The frequency is the same. The scale is different from the previous picture, but in one second, you'd see the there are two repetitions. It's still 2 hertz frequency, but what have I changed? I've ch changed the ampli amplitude. Sometimes it's the same as before, plus 1 to minus 1, but I've also introduced another amplitude of, it's actually plus 0.33 or 1 third to minus 0.33. So we change the amplitude in some cases, And we can use this to allow a signal element to represent more than one bit at a time. And the scheme, the scheme that we'll use, or I'll use in this example, is let's say I transmit uh,
I'll show you the scheme and then it'll make sense, I hope. The transmitter may have any sequence of bits. If there are two bits, 0, 0, then the scheme I'm going to use is to transmit a signal with an amplitude of minus 1. If it's 0, 1, minus 0 0.33. 1, 0, plus 0 0.33. 1, 1, plus 1. That's the scheme that the transmitter uses. We've got a sequence of bits to send. If the first two bits are 0, 0, then it will send a signal with an amplitude of like this one. It goes up to plus 1. But if the next two bits are 1, 0, then the amplitude will be plus 0 0.33. Given that scheme, can anyone just remember that? 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, minus 0 0.33. What's the bits received in this case? What bits, what sequence of bits do you receive? What are the actual Well, here we have a received signal which is plus 1. Plus 1 corresponded to what? 1, 1. Here we have minus 1. Minus 1 corresponded to what? 0, 0. Plus 0.33. 1, 0. So if you cannot remember, you see... 0, 0, minus 1, 1, 1, plus 1, 0, 1, minus 0.33, plus 1, uh, 1, 0, plus 0.33. Here we have minus 0.33, so it must be 0, 1. Minus 0 0.33, 0, 1 again. Plus 1, 1, 1. Down the bottom it's 0, 0, 1, 1. We'll come back to the scheme. How many bits did I receive? There are 16 there. 16 bits in 2 seconds, 8 bits per second. Between 0 and 1, there are 8 bits received. So my data rate is now 8 bits per second. In the previous case, we had a data rate of 4 bits per second. But we haven't changed the frequency or bandwidth. The frequency, if you look at the signal, here's one repetition in half a second. There are two repetitions in one second. That is, it's still a 2 hertz signal. Or better, a signal element still lasts for a quarter of a second. Same as before. That is, this signal element, the duration is a quarter of a second. So within one second there are four signal elements. But the way that we gain the data rate is that for each signal element we send two bits. And the way that we can achieve that is by having four different values of the signal element, four different magnitudes or four different levels. Instead of two levels, plus one and minus one, we now have four levels. So each level can represent two bits. So the number of levels that we have available can impact upon the data rate. If you increase the number of levels, you increase the data rate that you can achieve. What data is received? 
Same scheme as before. What did you receive? If you remember, the scheme was if the first bit is a 1, it's positive, and if the first bit is a 0, it's negative. So 0, 0, 0, 1 were negative something, 1, 1, 1, 0 were positive something, and 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, positive 1. So in fact, plus 0.33, sorry. was 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 again, 0, 1, 0, 0, so there's a different sequence of bits. Any sequence of bits we can cover using these diff four different levels. Questions before we see the impact of noise on these, these signals. So this is a new concept. We're no longer assuming two different levels. Something that we haven't done in uh, the rest of the course. Questions? Is the question related to this one? All right, I'll get to your quiz question later then. Any questions about the lecture or about this part? But we'll come back to that. So we've got a new concept. We're not restricted to having just two levels to represent our data. We can have as many as we like in theory. How can I increase the data rate further? Here we're getting 8 bits per second. In the previous case we had 4 bits per second. I want faster than 8 bits per second. What do I do? Be specific. What do we do? I want faster than 8 bits per second. But again, I don't want to change the bandwidth. More, more what? Think of these as the levels of the signal. Okay? Four different values of the magnitude. I'll go back to the previous one where we wrote it down. In this scheme, there are four different uh, magnitudes. Each magnitude or each level represents two bits. If I receive it, one of these four, I can map it back to the two bits. In the, in the previous scheme, we had two levels, positive and negative. Each level represented a single bit. So how do I make it faster again? More levels. How many more? What's the next step up? This one's four levels. We should go up to eight levels, where each level would represent three bits. And with eight levels, each level representing three bits, we'd have three bits per signal element. Here we have two bits per signal element. Two bits, two bits, two bits. If we had three bits per level, we'd have three bits per signal element. Or in one second, we'd have three by four, twelve bits per second. Go up to thirty-two, sixty-four levels, a thousand and twenty-four levels, ten bits per signal element. So the number of levels that we use will impact upon the data rate. What's the problem? The bandwidth isn't changing by increasing the number of levels. 
harder to analyze for you as a student, maybe, but uh, more specific, what maybe you're right. Uh, more, chance of getting errors. more chance of getting errors. The more levels we have, the more chance of getting errors. And I will not spend too much time on it, but the last two pictures. Uh, I think you have on, on the printout. Now we have an infinite number of components, different example, but here we have two levels. Here we have four levels. Remember we said the noise, the noise cause a bit error if the noise swaps the sign when we have two levels. For example, if I transmit at plus one and the noise brings the receive signal down to a negative value, then we'll get a bit error. So the noise magnitude needs to be large enough to bring our transmitted signal more than halfway down. That is, the received signal must be closer to the other value, which in this case is a magnitude of 1. With four levels, if I transmit it at, here at 0 0.33 third, then to get a bit error, then the noise must be a magnitude that will take me to another level, to maybe plus 1 or even minus 0.33. The difference is what? two-thirds, 0.66, whereas here the difference between levels is two. So the same amount of noise when we have more levels has a more chance of causing bit errors. And that's the problem with having more levels. It increases our data rate, but in the presence of noise we get more errors. It's not so clear on that picture. Uh, I'll just leave it as that explanation that an error will occur if the signal swaps to a different level or is nearer to a different level. And with the case of four levels, if it's 0.33 and the noise is, let's say, minus 0.4, it will be nearer to minus 0.33 and the receiver will think it's a different sequence of bits. With the same amount of noise, more chance of bit errors when you have more levels. But the more levels you have, the higher the data rate. So we have a trade-off there. Uh, with all other conditions the same, like the bandwidth, if we increase the number of levels, and assuming we cannot control the noise, the noise is always present, then if we increase the number of levels, then it increases the chance of errors. Now, it may be that the noise is so small that we can have a high number of levels, but eventually we'll reach some limit. We cannot have an infinite number of levels because eventually the noise will be large enough to cause too many errors. We'll see an example shortly of what uh, was a, a typical value for an old system. So we've seen in, in today's example what uh, well we've seen in, in the previous lectures increasing the bandwidth increases the data rate. There's some relationship between bandwidth and data rate. Today we've seen that accuracy of the signal, the number of components in the signal, the more accurate the signal, the less chance of errors. And we've seen a new thing that our signal can have more than just two levels. And the more levels, the higher the data rate. Except if we have noise, the more levels, the more errors. Go back to our lecture notes. And the last 10, 15 minutes we'll look at an equation that relates some of these factors together. So that you don't have to go through all these calculations, someone's done it for you and come up with an equation that gives us 
a relationship between the factors we've talked about during this topic. It's called channel capacity. Think of channel as the link. Okay, we have a link between transmitter and receiver. It's often called the, com called the communications channel. Capacity is what? What's capacity mean? The maximum we can achieve, the maximum we can fit in. So in our case, channel capacity is really what's the maximum data rate we can achieve across our link. Given a link with some characteristics, how fast can I send bits per second? That's what we're talking about here. Maximum data rate at which data can be transmitted over a given communication channel or link. And people have done analysis to relate data rate. We'll see in our equations data rate is represented as C, capacity, in bits per second. Bandwidth, B in hertz, plus other factors like noise, errors, number of levels. I think we'll see in the next one. We're looking at two theoretical models, two equations that people have developed that relate these factors. The Nyquist capacity and Shannon capacity, developed by Mr. Nyquist and Mr. Shannon. So they come up with models that give us how fast we can send data on a link, but under different conditions. Today we'll just do Nyquist capacity. Here it is. C equals 2B log base 2 of M. That's the equation. That's one to remember. C is the capacity. Or if that's confusing to you, think maximum data rate we can achieve. Data rate. Measured in bits per second. B is the bandwidth of our link or channel. So how much bandwidth do we have available? M is the number of levels that we have in our transmitted signal. In our previous examples we had one with two levels and then we moved up to four levels. So M was two and then we changed to M being four. So the capacity is two times the bandwidth times log base two of the number of levels. This assumes that there's no noise in the channel which is never true in practice. There's always noise present. But this is a simple model. If noise was not present, there was no noise, then this would give us a relationship between bandwidth levels and, and data rate. Let's do a, a few simple calculations just to see it in use. And I think it's in the slides that the example I'm going to go through, so uh, let's say we have a, remember dial-up modems, they run, dial-up internet access, you had your, your modem, a dial-up modem, and that connected to the telephone line. And that telephone line from your home went to some telephone exchange. So our modem, let's say this is our transmitter, and the telephone exchange nearby is the receiver. We want to know how fast we can send data via a dial-up uh, internet access. A telephone line, the one that you have coming into your home, not, not the mobile phone, a telephone line uses analog signals and for talking, for voice, it has a bandwidth available of about 3000 hertz. And the example will use 3100 hertz is the bandwidth we have available. And in fact what your modem did, your dial-up modem, not ADSL or cable modem, but the old dial-up modems, They'll take your data from your computer and convert it into a, some analog uh, representation of that data and send it instead of sending voice. If you ever used a dial-up modem, you would have known 
reason that you couldn't make a first call while you're using the internet. It was one or the other. Because the voice channel was used to send data. And the voice channel had a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz. So let's calculate how fast we can send data according to the Nyquist capacity equation. And let's say that signal transmitted is the simple one where we have high and low. That is two levels, m equal to two. So capacity, two times bandwidth, times by log in base two of m. Just plug in the numbers. Bandwidth in hertz, base 2 of 2. Everyone remember logarithms? If you don't, you'll go home and practice tonight in preparation for tomorrow's lecture. Log base 2 of 2 is 1. So we get 2 times 3,100 times 1 or 6,200 bits per second. Be careful. The units of bandwidth is in cycles per second, but in each cycle how many bits can we send is determined by the number of levels. So the resulting answer is in bits per second. In our telephone line using a dial-up modem, we can send at 6.2 kilobits per second. Anyone rem did anyone actually use a dial-up modem? Anyone remember one? The noise at least? Anyone remember the speed of your modem? 50, 56 kilobits per second was the typical speed of modems. 56 kilobits per second. Our question says the, the maximum data rate we can achieve is 6 kilobits, 6.2 kilobits per second. So you said 56 kilobits per second. How do you get 56? The bandwidth is the same. The modem was still using the voice channel. We can't change the bandwidth with the dial-up internet access. So how do we increase the capacity? M must go up, the number of levels. Let's try... What about M of 3? Does that make sense? M typically will be a, a power of 2. We'll not calculate, but M of 3 means 3 levels. I don't know, plus 1, 0, and minus 1. But what bits would they represent? So maybe don't write this one down because it's wrong, but if we said 3 levels, say three magnitudes, plus one, zero, and minus one, well, we could have plus one represent bit one, minus one represent bit zero, well, we don't need the third level in that case. It's a waste. What about plus one represents maybe one, one, minus one represents zero, zero, zero represents what? I don't know, one, zero. But what if we want to transmit 0, 1? Which level do we use? So that's why we can't use three levels. We want to be able to transmit any sequence of bits. If we had three levels, we would never be able to send the bits 0, 1. So we need a power of 2 in terms of the number of levels. So So that one we will not try. Try m equal to 4. What's the capacity? Well, same bandwidth times log base 2 
of 4. Log base 2 of 4 is 2, so it's double before. Six thousand two hundred times two, twelve thousand four hundred bits per second. So, all right, we increased, but we want around fifty-six kilobits per second. How many levels? Try and find it. If you want a capacity of fifty-six kilobits per second, how many levels do you need in the transmitted signal? Try. Okay. Try and calculate. what it would be. So again, the bandwidth in this example is fixed. If we want a data rate of 56 kilobits per second, I'll give you a hint, it's not exactly 56, I think it's something like 55,800, maybe 600. Uh, 800, I think. Not kilobits. If we want to achieve 56 kilobits per second, be precise, 55,800 bits per second. That's what your typical dial-up modem could achieve. And we have 3,100 hertz. What should M be? Again, Nyquist tells us the capacity is 2 times the bandwidth log base 2 of M. So what do we have? We know C fifty five thousand eight hundred. We know B three thousand one hundred. We don't know M. So to find M, what do we get? Log base 2 of M should equal... I hope I got this number right. Right by... Just rearranging, log base 2 of m should equal 55,800 divided by 2 times 3,100. Calculator time, what's that? 9. 9 divided by 9. I think it's exactly 9, or very, very close to 9. 55,000 divided by 6,000, about, equals 9. Log base 2 of m equals 9, therefore m equals 2 to the power of 9, 512. Log base 2 of 512 equals 9, because 2 to the power of 9 equals 512. If we have 512 levels, remember our first signal had 2, then we had an example with 4. Imagine 512 different levels, all within the same small space, then Using the bandwidth of 3,100 hertz, we could achieve the data rate of about 56 kilobits per second. So that's what the modem did. When it transmitted a signal, it mapped it to one of 512 levels. How can we go faster? Why, didn't you, why couldn't you buy a modem with one megabit per second? So the modems were 56 kilobits per second. Well, if we went up to, what? The next one up would be 1,024, which 
1024 would be 10, and it would be something like 64 kilobits per second. To get up to a, a reasonable speed, say a megabit per second, the number of levels you'd need would be just too many. Because, although it's not captured in this equation, the more levels, the more chance of errors. Let's summarize on Nyquist. The trade-offs we see from the equation are increasing the bandwidth B increases the data rate. We've said this multiple times before. The other thing we've seen today, increasing the number of signal levels M also increases the data rate. That's a good thing. That's what Nyquist equation tells us. But the Nyquist capacity equation assumes there's no noise. But when there is noise, we have other problems. Increasing the number of signal levels, M, makes it harder for the receiver to understand what it receives. That is, more errors. It's not shown in the equation, but it's true in practice. As M goes up, the number of errors go up. So that means there's some limit or practical limit in, pra in, in technologies to what... It's a good value for M. High for high data rate, low for low errors. Tomorrow we'll see Shannon capacity equation which takes into account noise and gives us a, a different relationship.